Hello, this is Mark Isaac from the Garage Gurus here at our TSC in St. Louis, and I want to welcome you to our Facebook live stream. Um, tonight we'll be discussing steering and suspension, and uh, we're going to be going through some service and some uh, uh, conditions that, that might be uh, uh, inflicted from the, the past winter we've had. So we'll kind of address it from that standpoint there of, of service, of damage, and, and broken components. If we have any questions tonight, we encourage uh, you to leave comments in uh, the space below. Uh, as an incentive to uh, participating with the live here tonight, um, we're giving away you know, these toolboxes as uh, part of like uh, just a giveaway, and there's also a $100 prepaid gift card uh, for the best question of the night. Um, I'll kind of kick things off by saying that as we we're coming out of this uh, late winter season into spring, uh, we kind of refer to it as a, a pothole season. You know, with you know, some states, that's a year-round condition. Um, we experience these hard winters that uh, really break up the roads with, uh, you know, uh, freeze-thaw conditions of, you know, potholes and, and frost heaves that really tear up the roads. It puts a big impact on uh, the steering and suspension components. Uh, you know, the more ice and snow we have in the winter months, uh, the more potential there is for these vehicles to, you know, run into curbs and go into ditches. And that's uh, putting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of damage on our control arms, ball joints, tie rods. And that's sort of the stuff I'm going to review here tonight. So where I'm going to start off with is um, an alignment. I've got a, a 2010 Corolla here in the background. And uh, we've already, you know, done like the, the rolling compensation and we've done our caster sweep. The vehicle came in with a, a, a pull and the customer said that, you know, he hit a curb and uh, he bent a rim and then he replaced the rim and the tire, but the vehicle still had a pull. So uh, when we got it in the shop here, we uh, uh, looked at the numbers and the spec on the right side, let me move to the side here, to the right side appears to be in spec. It is a negative camber spec vehicle. Uh, the caster is equal side to side. But when we look at the left side, we notice that the camber is clear to the other side of the spec. In fact, it's out of spec. It's positive. It's a, a, a camber cross camber of 1.5 degrees, so it's, it's quite a bit different from the other side. And also the SAI is off as well. So it's about a degree and a half difference from the other side. So uh, what we're looking at here is uh, something is, is potentially damaged because I'm going to move over to my cutaway of a, of a suspension system. Uh, this system here is you know pretty much like the Corolla. It's a McPherson strut with a, uh, uh, on, the, on the Corolla, it's a non-adjustable knuckle. So uh, there is no camber adjustment here. The bolts are a, a fixed bolt. Uh, we already checked there's no camber kits in it that would you know, change camber. But um, we definitely have some numbers that uh, aren't correct for the vehicle. So uh, I'm going to use these uh, wooden sticks to kind of represent you know, the two angles we're talking about, camber and SAI. And when I put this stick here up against the rotor and uh, so the camber represented in this application here shows it's slightly positive. Well, the spec on the Toyota is actually negative, so it would actually be leaning inward like this. That's a little exaggerated, but you get the idea. Negative camber is the spec on the Toyota, but right now it's, a, it's showing a positive value. Now, SAI is going to be re represented by this stick, and what SAI is, it's basically the steering axis. It's if you drew a line through the upper strut mount, through the lower ball joint, and viewed it from the front, that would be my steering axis. And basically on this Toyota, that's a fixed value. It shouldn't change. So it basically should be pretty close to equal side to side. As we see on our numbers uh, behind me, it's about a one and a half degree difference. So it, it's out of spec there. So upon further inspection, you know, we wonder why is the camber cambered out like this? And why is the SAI less uh, a lower degree value. So both the camber and the SAI have moved outboard in relation to vertical. So uh, basically what that's indicating is uh, we've already assessed that there wasn't any structural damage at the top of the strut. The lower ball joint has moved. And when the lower ball joint moves inboard, it basically changes the camber to a more positive value and it also changes the SAI to a slightly lesser negative value okay so uh, you know using our alignment machine as as a diagnostic tool 
we're basically seeing something that uh, basically coincides with the, with the description of uh, what our customers are telling us is that he made a sharp, hard impact into a curb here. He didn't think it was a big problem, but it ended up being, you know, a pole condition. Um, throughout the evening here, I'm going to be answering questions as they come up, uh, you know, from our prompter in the back here. I see that uh, we have a, quest, a question from uh, Chris from Orlando, Florida. The question is a good one. It comes up a lot in, um, you know, alignment shops and tire shops. It says, why my, my car shakes at 60 miles an hour? Do I need an alignment? Uh, that's a pretty good question. Uh, a lot of times uh, people uh, tend to think that an alignment is going to fix a vibration issue. It can in some instances, but usually not. Uh, usually a vibration issue is something dynamic. It's something rotating. Um, you know, a tire, a wheel assembly that's out of balance, a drive shaft that's out of balance. Um, if the vibration is taking place during braking, it could be, you know, a brake pulsation. So uh, not usually is it alignment related. It may not need an alignment, but it still needs to be looked at from a vibration standpoint. Here is something I will share with us. Um, you know, if we have an extremely loose tie rod end, we have a tie rod with a lot of looseness, a lot of play there, um, a really loose joint um, can exhibit, you know, vibration or shimmy, you know, at, at speed. So that might be something that um, uh, alignment's not going to fix that. What fixes that is, you know, obviously replacing the part and then doing an alignment. So, um, so from an alignment standpoint, we're, we probably, if it's related to vibration, uh, get some more detail from the customer, take the car for a drive, and verify that it's a dynamic thing, something rotating. Okay. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to some components and, and kind of show you some things that can take place, you know, in our, 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 our driving that we experience in our, in our harsh winter months when we're sliding into curbs and, you know, into ditches and... Uh, I'll start off with um, basically a condition of where a ball joint could possibly be bent. And if we see a ball joint that comes in, you know, this vehicle's been in an accident or in, you know, a little bit off-road, and uh, we see a ball joint bent to that degree, that's pretty serious. Even though it's, it's still intact, it's in the housing and it didn't break, uh, this here is telling us that this, you know, wheel end was in a severe impact. And most typically, it's, it's an impact from the side that's taking place. Uh, when it bends the stud like that, it usually takes out another part of the car that's pretty critical, and that is the knuckle that it's plugging into. So where that ball joint plugs into the taper here, uh, more than likely, the force it took to bend that stud also damaged the steering knuckle. And once the steering knuckle taper hole is damaged, uh, it's really, uh, there's no repair. It, it has to be replaced. A quick check. Now this one's obvious. So you can see uh, that it's pretty, pretty uh, out of round. And uh, the whole purpose of tapered holes is to hold the stud and the taper uh, completely stationary. It doesn't move. Uh, we don't want that, that stud rocking around in there. Uh, the, the longer a taper or a stud rocks around in a hole, the more potential it has to break in the future. So to do a quick check on this, this hole, what you would do is take a new ball joint and put it in the hole and basically try and rock it. If I can move that ball joint, then that's telling me that that hole is no longer, you know, in use. It has to go. So there's no repair. It's a replace. Okay. I'll kind of cover that over here as well. This is a tie rod. And uh, here's an example of a tie rod that, you know, basically has the same type of looseness. Uh, just even though that doesn't look like a lot of looseness, um, that's enough to basically condemn this, this whole assembly right here. So I kind of point to this because it's aluminum. And so a lot more chassis components, you know, knuckles and control arms are aluminum now. They can't take the big hit that maybe our, our cast or steel components from the past could. Um, Another type of ball joint failure, I guess I'll cover this. This could apply to almost any socket, whether it's a ball joint or a tie rod, is uh, severe rust. Uh, once the boot is sacrificed and water and corrosion build up on the stud and in the housing, it tears up the bearing quickly. And uh, in an extreme case like this example here, uh, this stud basically can pull out of the housing. So a failure like this, whether it's a ball joint or a tie rod, that's a catastrophic failure. So that's an accident right there. So this stuff all needs to be inspected. Okay. 
I'll move on to uh, some other components here and uh, something that's directly related to alignment and uh, something that can be, you know, damaged in, you know, wintertime driving, uh, especially, you know, side impacts and things like that are control arms. Like our example of the Toyota here, um, that lower control arm is basically kinked and it basically moved that ball joint to a different location. Um, so once we move the ball joint, we're affecting camber and in this case, SAI as well. And once you move camber, you're basically you're affecting toe it's also. Uh, other things we look at on control arms, obviously, is uh, uh, in our northern regions where we use a lot of road salt and corrosion, uh, severely rusted, you know, can weaken to possibly cause them to break or fracture. Um, another area that we always kind of point to is the condition of the bushings. And these vertical control arm bushings here are pretty notorious for failure. A lot of manufacturers use this design, and uh, they're, they're pretty known for, for, for shearing away from the outer shell or the inner sleeve. And so once that bushing gets, you know, sacrificed like that, or it gets loose, it uh, basically is changing position of that ball joint as this, this arm is loose at this point here. So we're, again, changing the ball joint position, you're changing caster and camber. Here's another example of a control arm failure. Um, this one, the, the complaint was there's uh, a loud popping noise on braking. And every time this vehicle would brake at low speed, it, the wheel would basically jump about two inches back and forth inside the wheel well. And so just to put this into motion, the bushing is, is completely, almost completely torn away. And it would cause the control arm to basically jump back and forth inside the bushing on, on brake forces. So things like this can uh, not only create noise, it can sometimes create like a brake pull because as, as that control arm changes, you know, position drastically, it's a changing caster which affects a pull condition. So these things can uh, all, all kind of be uh, looked at during inspection. Um, going into our steering linkage, uh, obvious failure of steering linkage is, you know, normal wear and tear, you know, as, as components wear down and exhibit looseness. Um, side impacts, you know, into our steering knuckle can sometimes, uh, in a severe case, create a bent, you know, tie rod assembly. Um, if it's a sleeve type, sometimes we've seen sleeves collapse, you know, because sleeves are hollow. So, um, but that would be a pretty hard hit, you know, to, to bend a sleeve or to bend a tie rod like this, but it does happen, okay? Um, if there is a hard enough impact on a, on a steering knuckle that basically could impart that force into the rack gear, um, sometimes we'll see the gear teeth in here break off or chip and what you would have is a spot in the rack is every time those broken teeth come around it could be a, a, a rough spot in the steering um, severely a severe case would like be completely broken teeth and you'd have like minimal engagement to the rack gear uh, a failure like this isn't really something you see uh, it's something you would feel so something like that I mean a hard enough hit on that rack sideways can damage the teeth in here so uh, that basically what that does is warrant replacement of the whole unit. Okay. So um, sway bar links. Um, really, the the failure on these here is just just normal wear and tear. But the the symptom would be you know a, a rattling noise going over bumps. Uh, you know, as the vehicle oscillates up and down, uh, it'll basically create a lot of looseness in the in the socket here, and so you'll hear like a rattling noise as the vehicle goes over bumps and things like that. It doesn't really affect alignment. It basically affects, you know, just the drivability of the vehicle. If they're broken completely, it affects, you know, the body roll of the vehicle because you no longer have a link of your sway bar to the control arm. So I'm going to move on here and we're going to go to our next bench and we'll address uh, shocks, struts, and uh, steering knuckles. Okay. And uh, when inspecting shocks and struts, uh, one of the first things you'll, you're looking for as far as your inspection um, is, you know, fluid leakage. You know, on, on vehicles that get some miles on them, uh, you'll start to see, just like anything hydraulic, it's going to leak over time. It's going to find a way out. They'll typically leak out the top, and you'll see a fluid stain down the side of the unit, and it's usually, you know, recognizable pretty easily. Um, another way that the shocks will fail is they'll have no more dampening internally. So... The, the, the shaft here will move through, the, through the, the shock cylinder very easily 
it won't have very good dampening. Um, basically, if you, if you jounce the vehicle at one corner that has a, a worn out shock, it, it'll, it'll oscillate several times before it comes to a rest. Typically, we'd always, we always kind of said it was like one and a half cycles. You know, when you bounce a vehicle, it should come to a rest within one and a half cycles. You know, so uh, a shock that has no rebound control just lets the spring oscillate till it runs out of energy. Um, another type of failure we're starting to see more and more now on a lot of shocks and struts is a complete lockup. Um, we've seen shocks where the piston is seized in the bore. And on a, a case like that, you'd have just kind of like the opposite complaint from a, a car owner is that it has terrible ride control. There's, there's no dampening whatsoever. It's a completely locked out assembly. So the, vib the harshness of the you know, suspension travel just goes directly into the body of the vehicle as this has no plunging action inside. So it has no way to dampen. So it's a completely locked out assembly, very hard ride. Um, this example here is a pretty good one. And this is directly related to impact. And as you can see, this shaft here is, is bent pretty good. And the history on this vehicle here was the original owner uh, basically said I was never in an accident. Uh, this just happened during normal driving of the vehicle. He doesn't know when it happened, but uh, basically he did say that occasionally, intermittently, there'd be like a popping noise coming from you know, the left front of the car. And so uh, what we imagine is like where this bent part went down inside the tube, it would catch you know, and release. So uh, yeah, it's possible to see you know, bent shafts like that. Okay. Um, another thing we're looking at are is the strikeout bumpers. Uh, this strikeout bumper, usually it's incorporated into the boot that fits on the, on the shock tube. And uh, this one's in pieces. It basically uh, came off the car behind me, and we'll, we'll, I'll walk over there next. And uh, basically it just came apart from impact. Basically the, the, the shocks and struts, I mean the, 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 the strut and the spring are worn uh, it's a high mileage vehicle to the point where it doesn't really have rebound control anymore and it's just been bottoming out. So it, as it bottoms out, it's just, it just smashes that strikeout bumper into pieces. Okay. So I'll, I'll come over here and kind of point to some things on this uh, Jetta. This is a high mileage vehicle. Um, as I point to you know, the strikeout bumper here, uh, this thing is you know, bottomed out so many times that it's really damaged the, uh, the, the strikeout bumper. So that's kind of some evidence of, you know, uh, harsh road conditions, potholes, frost heaves, a lot of vertical impact, and, uh, you know, the shock and spring no longer have control of that suspension. Okay. Um, other things to look at on strut assemblies, um, things to inspect, obviously, if it's, a, if it's a strut that rotates with the steering axis like this one here, we've got um, uh, uh, an upper bearing that bears the weight of the car, and so as that bearing wears, it, it it gets tight, it gets, uh, it gets noisy. It um, uh, basically could give us a memory steer issue where you, know, you steer one direction, let go of the steering wheel, it stays steered in that direction. So uh, yeah, as, as those upper bearings fail, we have that condition. Another type of failure that can take place is, um, it can happen to anything, it doesn't have to be a strut, it could be anything with coil spring, is uh, coil spring breakage. You know, as we get rust and corrosion build up you know, in our components, uh, springs are always working, uh, whether they're supporting the car going down the road or sitting in the driveway. And they're always supporting the weight of the car. So we get some rust to build up in that spring, and eventually it'll fracture. So when that spring fractures, you lose chassis height, uh, you lose you know, ride control. But another thing that we kind of point to on, a, on some strut applications is the danger of that spring breaking and coming outside this plate here. So uh, if we're in a certain application where the spring fractures and a piece of the spring is hanging off the plate, it can come in contact with the tire. So that's a, a pretty dangerous condition. Be sure to look for that. Okay. Um, so as we've gone through the years of automotive service, we've noticed uh, a change in the way we go to, go to market. Um, we're showing a complete strut assembly here. This has become common in the industry. Um, when you look back in time, the way we used to sell this was, you know, we sold just the shock and then just the upper mount and then the spring and the, you know, the internals. It, it, you know, we entered the, uh, the world of assemblies and assemblies make sense. They're, they're obviously more expensive. There's more components to it, but 
uh, in the long run, it is cheaper for the customer and it turns the car around faster. I mean, it's a lot easier to just put this assembly in the car rather than have to put it in a spring compressor, compress it, and change the components. Um, so from the assembly's point of view, we're starting to see more and more service on the car going the assembly route. And that kind of transitions me to you know, a control arm that I'm sure a lot of us have changed out control arms now, uppers and lowers, that are completely you know, sold in as, as an assembly with bushings and ball joints. And that kind of just transitions into the next area on the vehicles that um, points to uh, you know, going the assembly route, and that is uh, complete knuckle assemblies. And so uh, that's what we've got featured on the bench and what we're showing here on the car as, as an install is a complete knuckle assembly. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the benefits of this here uh, as, as this becomes kind of like a new, a new feature on the market. Um, I see that we have a question basically on this topic right here. It says, uh, Mark from Burbank says, what's the benefit of using the complete knuckle assembly and not just changing the bearing? Okay, it's a good point uh, because a lot of guys say, you know, I've been pressing bearings in and out of these things for many years. Why would I buy a whole assembly? It's more expensive. Well, yeah, it's more expensive, but when you start adding up the costs of all the associated, you know, components, uh, we have to look at the benefits of the complete assembly. Uh, one is it's all new. There's nothing rusted. There's, uh, it's not a reman. It's a completely new casting. It's a new bearing. Uh, the installation is already done. If it does come with uh, a wheel, wheel speed reluctor, that's in place. Um, if the application has a dust shield, it comes with a new dust, because a lot of times in the rusted, you know, high rust areas, this thing is like Swiss cheese, okay? It's rusted away. Um, you don't have the potential for damage. I mean, a lot of times when you're dealing with pressing the old bearing out and pressing new bearing in, um, damage can take place to the bearing. Um, you have to salvage the flange in a lot of applications. So there's, uh, there's benefits to the complete unit, and probably the biggest benefit is the time. The time it takes to install this unit as a, as a whole piece uh, is a fraction compared to you know, pulling the, the flange apart and you know, changing out the bearing. Uh, the cost of the tools, too. I mean, think of the, the on-the-car service tools to take this all apart, all the adapters and the press. and um, or if the guy says, well, I, I don't use the on-the-car tools, I, I just go to the press. Uh, you have to take the whole knuckle off, you go to the press, you press it apart, you support it. So it basically, it's kind of a trade-off of the cost of the whole unit versus the cost of time to you know, deal with pressing the bearing in and out. Uh, the other benefits uh, of like a complete unit is obviously if it, if it has uh, caliper slides, they're brand new. They're not rusted, they're not, they're not deteriorated. Um, the threads, the threads are all new. We don't have to deal with broken fasteners, you know, cross-threaded, you know, holes and things like that. And uh, the E-coat is an uh, a electrostatic paint coating on there that maintains the, the finish for a while. Um, one thing we also kind of, as I'm talking on complete assemblies like this here, is uh, I always kind of impress upon the importance of the axle nut. So. Uh, we do include an axle nut with every one of these knuckles and kind of convenient, the axle nut uh, comes with the torque value on the bag. So it's, the information is right there, it's easily serviced and any time we take our sh a shaft apart we impress upon people to put a new uh, nut on there. And we also definitely you know, stress the importance of torquing this nut to the proper value. Um, one more thing I'll mention as far as like uh, damage that's incurred during winter driving and, and things to look for, problems. Um, right here in the shock tube area, um, this is somewhere where we see a lot of damage take place, especially on these type of knuckles where the tube is inserted into the knuckle and held with a pinch bolt. Okay, uh, These ones are prone to bending right here. We got a, a, a good hard impact into the wheel assembly. Um, we've seen the strut tubes bend here and a uh, a bend in the strut tube here leads to a camber change and you know change camber change toe so uh, just use that indicator as part of your diagnostic okay um, let me move on here uh, we've covered the the car side of things let's take a look at some uh, inspection procedures and some some things to look at on trucks 
going to uh, move over here to our, our Ford van. Uh, the full-size trucks are still on the road, and uh, you know the majority of smaller trucks, half-ton trucks, we've uh, we've basically seen a transition in the steering linkage to rack and pinion. So uh, we still see a lot of uh, conventional, what we call conventional linkage, on our bigger trucks, three-quarter, one-ton, and up trucks. And uh, uh, just talking about you know the the effects of you know winter driving on these it applies to the same as we do on cars. You know we get these big impacts from the side of this vehicle, you know, six to eight thousand pounds sliding into a curb uh, with a single point contact on that, on that wheel assembly, puts a lot of load across that steering linkage, puts a lot of load on the, steer, on the, on the uh, ball joints as well. So uh, a big impact from the side here uh, could not only, you know, damage the, the joint itself here, but it could also damage the taper that the joint is plugged into on the on the knuckle or on the uh, pitman arm, so um, to try and see that looseness to to test by hand would be very hard. These big linkages like this here, it's it's hard to get movement with just hand force. So uh, we're going to share with you just a little tip that uh, we use to kind of uh, exert some force across that linkage to look for looseness in these components. So uh, ref we refer to this test as a dry park test, and uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to lower the vehicle onto its wheels, you know, onto the on flat ground. Uh, we can do it on the alignment rack. Just don't use your turn plates, you know, because turn plates give. You know, we, we want it to be on solid ground. And with the engine not running, have someone, an assistant, rock that steering wheel back and forth. And what he's going to do, he's going to put the whole steering linkage in motion uh, in a short range. And what you'll do is part of your inspection is start feeling at each one of these joints and doing a visual as well and we're able to check all the joints in the steering linkage and the steering shaft coming down from the steering wheel. So we'll use this as an example here, our, our conventional steering gearbox. Um, you know, we've got a steering shaft in this, you know, you know, leading down from the column into uh, the gearbox. So we're looking for looseness, you know, along the steering shaft. Um, we're looking for looseness at the flex coupler possibly looseness at the splines where the splines plug into, you know, the, the front of the input shaft of the box. I mean, just this little bit of looseness right here, it's kind of hard to see, but I think you can kind of see it. That little bit of looseness right there is enough to basically be amplified by the diameter of the steering wheel to almost like an inch of movement up at the steering wheel. So just that little bit right there gets basically magnified by the diameter of the steering wheel. So as we're rocking that steering wheel back and forth, we're imparting that motion down into the gearbox. And from this point here down to the sector, we're going to be looking for any lost motion. You know, if I'm rotating this right here, I should see motion of the, or I should feel movement of the sector right here in the bottom side of the box. If I'm able to turn this and not feel the sector move, basically the box is out of adjustment. It's worn internally. Um, we don't really service these anymore um, from a standpoint of adjustment. Uh, typically, we're replacing in, in, today's, in today's market. So uh, another thing that we're looking for as far as looseness goes is as I rotate this back and forth, I'm looking for lateral or side-to-side -side movement of the sector down here. If I see side-to-side -side movement of the sector when I rock this steering back and forth, basically the bottom part of the bearing assembly here has got wear in it, and it's, it's exhibiting, exhibiting itself as looseness. Um, continuing out, once I get the pitman arm moving across the linkage. This one's a good example of one that's completely wasted. So that's, a, that's something we've had in the classroom for a long time. It's, it's completely wiped out. But you would look for looseness here. Um, not only of looseness of the, you know, of the stud inside the joint, you're also looking for looseness of the stud in the taper hole. Okay? And so I'll move to the linkage here. And as we transmit that movement from the pitman arm into the steering linkage, then we're looking at all the joints across the linkage for that movement. So with this dry park test, it gives us a big mechanical leverage, like an advantage over that linkage to test for looseness. Um, here's another example of like where we've gone the way of, uh, of uh, you know, assemblies. Let me see, I've got a question here. And it's a good one. Uh, Ahmed from 
Ahmad from Dearborn, Michigan. What's the best way to check ball joints on a standard A-frame hoist? Oh, okay, uh, that's good. Um, let's see, it's gonna depend on what type of system uh, your, your vehicle is. Like this solid, basically what you call like a shared axle Ford where you know it's a twin I-beam. Um, you basically just, it could just be free hanging like this. There's no load of the spring on those joints. You could support it under the I-beam and basically just rock the tire in and out and vertical, depending on what the manufacturer calls for. Some manufacturers call for vertical, some call for back and, you know, lateral. Um, an A-frame hoist, let me see, uh, again, depends on how we have to unload the suspension. Like a traditional type one suspension, where you have an upper control arm, lower control arm, and the spring on the lower control arm. Something like that, I would have to unload that steering knuckle. So I would basically move my, my support for the vehicle uh, off the frame and I'd put it underneath the lower control arm as far out as I could get it. And basically what that would do, that would uh, unload the spring, it would take the load of the spring off the knuckle, the knuckle basically now is floating on the, on the, the upper and lower ball joints, and I would check you know, the upper and lower ball joints for looseness at that point there. So it's all about like unloading the suspension. Like a traditional McPherson strut like our jet over here, um, the typical uh, way we support that vehicle is under the body and we just let the suspension hang down and that puts the lower ball joint in an unloaded condition. Uh, the ball joint in the Jetta is a, uh, a follower ball joint, it's not a load carrier ball joint. So it's basically unloaded with the suspension hanging like that. So yeah, those are good questions. Um, let's see, I've got a, uh, one of our guys taking a class at the TSC down in Atlanta and it's good, uh, we have our classes involved there. It says, what's the easiest way to get the toe sleeve loose when it's frozen? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, our guys from Atlanta might not see the level of rust we do up here in the north. And um, uh, the guys up north, they, they fight this all the time. I know, it, depending on how much rust, <laughs> uh, depends on how, se how, how severe you're going to uh, attack that sleeve. But a traditional sleeve like this, where it's an open slot, um, we don't see these much anymore, but for big trucks like this, um, first and foremost, what I would do is uh, I would try impact. Now, a lot of guys will grab the torch, you know, but the thing with the torch is we're heating up metal that probably shouldn't be heated up, but hey, when you're up north and you're dealing with rust that basically has destroyed this thing, um, the heat, heat is the way to go. But I'm going to try impact first. So I'll take my air hammer and I'll just beat on the clamps and the sleeve and the the surrounding areas and just have the rust starting to pour off this thing and you know spray it up with you know whatever type spray lube you got and they make a hook type tool that will catch into the groove here and as you pull on the tool it's a lever with a hook it basically slightly opens up the sleeve that kind of breaks it loose and then it'll assist you turning the sleeve clockwise or counterclockwise. So yeah, there are, there are big hook tools here with, with sliding bar you know, levers that you can hook into the sleeve and rotate. But I would definitely wail on it first with a good air hammer. And uh, if that doesn't break it loose, I, you know, hey guys, you gotta use the heat. And I know the guys up north are like, ah, I'm grabbing the heat first. But the only problem with the heat is while you're adjusting tow, it, it, as you heat this up, it's gonna change the tow value. So you have to kind of like wait for it to cool down because uh, the toe is going to change quite a bit as the thing cools. So it'll expand with the heat and then it shrinks back as it cools off. So you're chasing your toe around a little bit. But uh, yeah, I guess it's relative to like, you know, how much rust and corrosion you have in your area. That's a good question. I always like answering questions about an air hammer. Um, back to our linkage here. Um, I'll just kind of finish by saying this is gone assembly. Uh, we've got uh, applications for GM, Ford, Dodge, and Jeep of complete one-box assemblies. And I guess the advantage that we'd say is like to the customer, it's all new. It's, you know, one piece, well, not one piece, but one box. Uh, the advantage to the technician, it's already put together. You don't have to take it, a, you know, put everything together. Um, an advantage for the jobber is that it's all sourced. You don't have to look for this tie rod, this sleeve, this sleeve. It's already complete one unit. So um, from a stocking standpoint, that's just kind of a benefit to a lot of jobbers. Um, from a technician standpoint, it's easy to install. It's ready to go. It's really close on tow. You know, obviously we can't be perfect uh, for every application, but just a tip for, for guys say, well, I don't have an alignment 
I don't have alignment equipment in my shop, or maybe you know I'm doing this you know at my own garage. I don't have alignment. How do I make sure the toe is close? Um, Basically what you do is just take measurements off your old vehicle, measure from center to center of the tie rod assemblies here, use a sleeve to adjust it to get it close, and then, you know, get down to the alignment, the alignment shop. But close to zero toe and you're, you're probably pretty good. Okay. Um, let's see. I've covered a lot of stuff tonight. I probably rambled on a little bit, but it's good to have the questions. Um, uh, yeah, uh, participation is uh, something we always encourage in these things. Um, if uh, you guys have any more questions or comments, we're going to check, you know, the comments uh, uh, after the, after we conclude here tonight, and we'll, we'll get back to you and try and reply as many as we can. Uh, I'll just finish by by thanking everyone for joining. I'm Mark Isaac from the Garage Gurus, and uh, thanks for tuning in. <laughs>